thanks everyone for your attendance. Uh, uh, I'm coming from uh, industrial engineering background and, um, and during my PhD, I uh, took uh, some of my PhD courses from mathematics and computer science uh, schools uh, back uh, in Singapore uh, NTU. And uh, now uh, for about seven years, I'm best in business schools. So I've been in different uh, environments and different schools. And uh, to be very honest and open with you, when I received uh, Hadi's email and Hadi's invitation to give a talk uh, at the Optima, knowing the fact that uh, most of you guys are coming from uh, mathematics and, um, and, and science. So it was a bit kind of uh, conservative whether I should say yes or no, um, because of uh, some of the differences that we have in the way that we approach uh, research. But uh, I said, let's let me, you know, uh, accept it and challenge myself and uh, try to kind of um, uh, open this um, conversation with uh, people who think differently and um, and look at uh, research uh, from different perspectives. And let's see whether we can find some common grounds on which we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, do some uh, interesting work together. So I have a bit of back and forth uh, between uh, industry and university as well. Um, before, uh, after doing my uh, uh, bachelor in industrial engineering, I moved to industry, worked for about five years, and then started my PhD. At the same time, I was working in uh, an R&D institute called, um, uh, named ASR, Agency for Science and Technology in Singapore. After finishing and completing my PhD, I moved to, um, uh, to Siemens Thematic, so as a, a supply chain um, uh, business consultant. Um, and I worked there as a kind of um, uh, data analyst and uh, business consultant for a few years and, um, and traveled all over Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, visiting different businesses, different kind of people and working on different kind of practical supply chain problems and then moved to um, uh, RMIT um, and again continued my academic career. So, you know, through this uh, kind of um, uh, moves, uh, I kind of became very much interested in doing some multidisciplinary work in the area of logistics and supply chain management. And uh, I see kind of, I find uh, really real meaning and value in conducting this type of research. Um, when I compare it to the time that I was just doing some theoretical work and um, with no really implication or impact and what's happening in the real world. So I'm trying to educate myself more and more and try to find different sorts of tools and applications that um, help us to tackle those, um, you know, uh, industry oriented and business driven problems. I use a game theory, applied OR and uh, applied AI as well in some of the works that I do. So I'm not kind of um, very much dependent on the application or tools very much focused on the uh, problem for the problem and you know application of that uh, research piece and uh, how how can we tackle those problems through different combination of different tools. Um, uh, currently, uh, I'm focusing on two aspects of supply chain resiliency: one from macro level and another one is micro level. At macro level, I'm looking at the international trade uh, global supply chain resilience interface. And, and looking at different kind of um, uh, trends and, 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 and events that are reshaping or reconfiguring the global supply chains, such as Brexit and, and, and trade war between different countries and, um, and, and, and reconfiguration of the global supply chain network and global business um, in broader term. And how does uh, you know, those uh, policy makings at international trade level um, will impact or interact with uh, the performance of global supply chain logistics and, and how can we make our um, uh, supply chains more resilient in Australia, which is a, a hot topic now, not only in Australia, but many other countries. And at micro level, I'm looking at supply chain resiliency, uh, the interface of, uh, interface of uh, the supply chain and uh, digital supply chains and uh, cybersecurity. And I'm trying to figure out how, 
how can we uh, develop different sort of effective uh, mitigation strategies uh, that um, uh, tackle these uh, disruptions, um, uh, cyber attack driven disruptions in our supply chain uh, by combining and uh, kind of merging uh, both um, technical or digital um, uh, 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 cybersecurity kind of strategies, uh, combining it with some um, uh, standard supply chain procurement and uh, contingency planning and so on. So this is another area that I'm currently very much kind of um, involved in. Uh, and we are collaborating with different people, um, uh, you know, from India, some Indian um, uh, leading Indian universities, such as IITK and Bitsbalani, on the future of agribus agribusiness trade between Australia and, um, and India, um, uh, and also uh, uh, working with some people from the UK as well on the very similar topic, uh, looking at the policy making uh, in the aftermath of Brexit and how um, they will impact the performance of our uh, global uh, agribusiness supply chains. So this is um, a little bit about myself. And uh, let me just jump into three pieces of work that I want to uh, showcase today. And then I will seek your um, uh, comments and feedback and some recommendation would be really welcome here. Uh, help us to kind of improve the way that we work. And also that would be nice to exchange some ideas. So. The way that I kind of uh, want to present will be very much focused on the problem formulation and the kind of conceptual uh, framework for the modeling uh, of these three pieces that I'm going to uh, present. And I'm not going to uh, very much focus on the mathematical modeling itself and the way that we analyzed it, because I know that you guys are much smarter than me when I just point at some of the uh, uh, key um, strategies that we implemented. I'm sure that you will um, uh, uh, get uh, what, what I'm trying to say. Uh, and the pa papers are available online, so you can uh, go through the papers if you're interested and see um, uh, the way that we kind of... Um, and we model those problems and help and, and solve them. So the first piece is a paper that is published in IJPE. And uh, we tried to see um, what is the application of sharing economy, which is a kind of uh, cooperative, agribusiness cooperative that was in agribusiness kind of domain uh, for many years, how we can kind of uh, um, uh, look at it uh, as a as a as an internet enabled uh, digital uh, sharing economy platform uh, that can be applied in organic food supply chains and how it can uh, contribute to sustainable development goals. Um, and uh, the, uh, the the case that uh, basically motivated and inspired us to uh, look at such problem was a, a social enterprise based in. Uh, the south part of India, uh, Kerala, uh, uh, One Yard uh, Organic Farmers Fair Trade Association. And as you, as some of you may know, social enterprises are uh, some sort of um, uh, uh, committee-driven uh, organizations that are trying to promote sustainable development uh, in um, some, you know, uh, in some communities, local communities. And in India, as you may know, uh, there are many, many uh, farmers, and many of which are not really yet um, kind of uh, mechanized, and many of them are uh, still doing some, um, you know, uh, uh, conventional, uh, their approach is very conventional to agribusiness and agriculture. And in this specific uh, case that we were considering, there are lots of organic smallholders in um, uh, Kerala, in that uh, uh, southern uh, city of uh, India, and they uh, are uh, trying to pool their resources and uh, help each other cooperate and collaborate in different ways because of their um, uh, financial limitations and constraints that they have. They try to collaborate with each other in a way that they can uh, better utilize the um, uh, capacity of their um, uh, equipments as well as uh, the uh, labor and workforce that limited labor and workforce that they have. And at the same time, they had to kind of uh, come up with a smart strategies, helping them to reduce their um, their costs so that they can um, they can uh, come up with a reasonable pricing strategy and uh, enabling them to um, to compete in a very competitive market 
where there are uh, many uh, established companies and corporates who are presenting and offering um, the same kind of products, but not necessarily organic uh, at a much lower cost and, uh, and, and at, a, at a much lower price. Um, so those were some of the key motivations that we had. And we tried to, first of all, understand what are, the, what are their key concerns and what are their key challenges that they have and um, and what are the benefits of um, you know developing and conceptualizing uh, uh, a sharing a digital sharing economy platform for them through which they can mechanize and automate some of their uh, their their uh, activities that they currently have as part of this uh, social enterprise. Um, in order to do so, we spoke to um, uh, some of the key players of this uh, association. Uh, through uh, one of the uh, members that we had uh, who's coming originally from that part of India. And um, we, uh, we also looked at the, um, the secondary data, uh, went through all the uh, industry reports that we had and also government reports that we had and some of the data that was available uh, online on different platforms to understand exactly what are what were their key problems and issues, the challenges, strategies, and so on, so that we can come up with a kind of more realistic model, if you like, that captures some of the key features of their day-to-day um, uh, -day operations and business problems and so on. So we looked at those uh, documents and uh, we tried to address these questions how uh, we try to integrate and concurrently address the production inventory planning, so which was one of the key questions that they had, uh, pricing decision making, and at the same time, and at the end of the day, uh, after, you know, in any cooperative, uh, you know, whether it is uh, internet enabled or not, uh, there is a profit allocation problem as well. So how can such, you know, the, the profit that is obtained through that cooperation or cooperative agreement, how it can be fairly allocated among the participants of um, uh, this uh, such platform. So we try to address uh, how does organic smallholders can improve their competitiveness and, and, and contribute to the uh, sustainable development goals by forming a sharing economy-based cooperative and what are the benefits of aggregation and pooling those resources and, resource and activities based on SE concept within the uh, 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 organic food supply chain. So uh, in order to do so, we first try to kind of look at a benchmark, uh, uh, benchmark model where there is no such cooperation or cooperative exist. And uh, we try to, uh, for, to analyze that benchmark model so that we can compare it and, and look at the, some of the incentives and some of the challenges that exist in order to incentivize and motivate the members to join such cooperative. And then we developed um, uh, a cooperative based model and, and, and we try to solve those models and compare them. And, um, and in order to do so, we had to develop some um, a heuristic solution algorithm because we couldn't find the um, exact solution to some of the problems that we developed because of the complexities that we faced with. Um, and uh, we tried to characterize those uh, uh, concepts after we solved them through uh, some uh, computational studies. So this is the way that we looked at uh, the modeling and uh, we tried to look at the uh, different organic food supply chains there are uh, different farmers and there are, um, this is a non-cooperative scenario basically, uh, where there are uh, uh, multiple uh, organic food supply chains in different areas. And uh, in each organic food supply chain, there exists different number of farmers and farm that we showed there. And each of them are kind of uh, delivering their products to a single enterprise and then they do their own pricing, they do uh, their own you know, uh, inventory production planning individually and in isolation and in a non-cooperative manner. And they make decision on their uh, production inventory planning and pricing uh, decision um, uh, uh, separately. And, and we consider the fact that they're competing um, in the market, in a shared market, where there are some conventional food producers, 
and uh, they have some advantage in terms of um, you know um, uh, uh, lower costs and uh, and also lower pricing um, that um, uh, you know uh, put them in a better position in terms of attracting higher demand. Um, so we try to um, model their demand functions um, and uh, and and there are some associations between. Um, uh, the um, uh, competition level uh, between conventional food and organic food that is coming from the literature. And also we understand that um, uh, the demand is price uh, sensitive as well. So this is also uh, something that we considered. And uh, through this model, we try to kind of model the inventory uh, production planning um, uh, problem and pricing problem. Um, and and uh, we try to solve those models in a sequential manner. Um, uh, at, after uh, modeling that specific problem, we looked at the cooperative scenario where um, uh, now we understand that among those, um, we consider that among those um, multiple uh, individual organic food supply chains that we had there, um, uh, some of them might have the interest and might see a benefit in joining to a sharing economy platform. Um, and then instead of, you know, just a limited number of farmers, now we have a higher number of, uh, larger number of farms uh, who join this um, uh, digital cooperative platform and uh, through which they try to pool their resources and they try to increase and expand their capacity, both in terms of um, the warehousing and in terms of production planning. Uh, and, and that enables them to uh, you know, compete better in the market in terms of pricing and by lowering their cost. Um, and, uh, and this platform is responsible for making um, some uh, decisions. Uh, first of all, uh, it facilitates and coordinates resource, sh resource sharing between those uh, farmers and also uh, enable them to do group pricing and uh, uh, and procurement and also at the end of the day uh, when there is a, uh, a profit obtained through this cooperative there should be a way of uh, uh, sh um, fair sharing of um, uh, allocation of profit among the members who join this cooperative and at the same time we consider the fact that there might be some other uh, organic food supply chains who wish to continue um, uh, uh, operating individually. And this is not something that we choose. We look at the dynamic of the uh, problem and see if there's any incentive uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, those supply chains to join that, um, uh, that, that platform or not. So the type of uh, decisions that we are looking at is very similar to the benchmark model. And also um, uh, the only difference is that now we are looking at um, uh, the, uh, some kind of integration um, and uh, resource pooling in this specific um, uh, 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 cooperative between those organic food supply chains. And we model uh, model it uh, in the same way that we modeled the uh, the first scenario, and then um, and uh, and we try to solve their models. Uh, this is the way that we uh, looked at the uh, problem formulation uh, and um, and the way that we try to solve them. Um, as you can see, there are two scenarios there: non-cooperative and cooperative scenario. Uh, the way that we model it is that we first in first stage, it's a two-stage uh, problem. First stage, uh, they look at their pricing problem. So how much uh, they want to uh, sell their products in the market in competition with uh, con uh, conventional producers. And, um, and then uh, in the second stage, uh, and, and at the same time, we look at the pricing problem of the uh, conventional uh, supply chains as well. Uh, and, um, and, and in the second stage, we look at the optimal order uh, assignment because now the corporate, uh, after we understand that, okay, how much uh, we wanna uh, uh, sell our products. So it tells us uh, what's the demand that we are targeting and aiming for. And in order to uh, meet that demand, we have to come up with optimal order assignment. Uh, something like inventory uh, production kind of planning, very classic uh, 
uh, inventory uh, production planning problem. And then we, we have to, because we have multiple farms operating as part of each organic food supply chain, we have to allocate, find optimal order assignment policy, um, uh, and we do it in the second uh, stage and also optimal order production quantities as well. So uh, based on the order assignments that we have, what is the optimal order pro uh, production quantities for each of those uh, uh, farms? So we start from um, the enterprise level problem, and then we move to uh, supply chain uh, problem and farm level problem. We do the same thing for uh, the cooperative scenario. Uh, and as I said, uh, when it comes to uh, solving the problem, uh, because it's a sequential uh, problem, so they are, as you know, interdependent uh, or interconnected. So um, uh, when we wanted to solve them, we couldn't solve those problems at the same time um, using exact algorithms. So what we have done, we came up with two-step solution uh, procedures. Uh, in step one, we look at the in individual uh, organic food supply chains, um, uh, organic farms, and solve their problems. And in step two, we look at the um, uh, conventional food producers, because these are the two uh, main players and key players in the market who are, um, I'm, I'm pointing at these conventional food producers, they have their own uh, demand function and they have their own decision making on pricing as well. So uh, we have to solve both um, uh, problems uh, in sequence. So we came up with um, a heuristic uh, solution algorithm. And uh, after solving those problems, now uh, what uh, we have to do is to construct a fair uh, profit allocation policy. Uh, uh, and uh, we use different uh, 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 method to distribute the additional generated profit. And when I say additional pro generated profit, uh, we compare the uh, cooperative scenario with non-cooperative scenario. And if there is any additional uh, profit um, uh, between the case that if I operate individually and don't join the cooperative and uh, the case that I join the cooperative, now if there is um, and, and we calculate the total profit uh, in both cases, and then we see if there's any additional profit, then how such additional profit obtained through cooperative scenario or cooperative um, uh, methodology, how it can be, uh, it should be kind of distributed among uh, different uh, players. So um, we uh, use some um, uh, um, basic uh, or a standard kind of um, uh, profit allocation uh, policy that exists in uh, game theory and uh, applied economics. So, uh, and, and they uh, helped us to come up with uh, some policy in terms of uh, profit allocation. Uh, but uh, in order to understand exactly what does that mean uh, uh, for those farmers in terms and, and also uh, in terms of policy making, when it comes to pricing, and how can we ensure that uh, such uh, cooperative really helps different organizations to um, uh, to um, uh, to come up with the uh, to to first of all have the incentive and uh, motivation to participate in such cooperative, and at the same time lead to uh, you know higher uh, profit. There are some conditions. We realize that um, uh, when we look at the uh, pricing um, uh, strategy of those, we looked at um, uh, the uh, individual case where uh, uh, you know those supply chains participate in that game uh, individually, and we look at their total profit obtained through that game, and we looked at the cooperative scenario where. Uh, those three supply chains uh, 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 merge and then um, they create and they make a coalition basically. And uh, we try to see um, uh, under, uh, you know, uh, we looked at the pricing uh, scenario of that cooperative and we try to understand under which, um, uh, you know, price range the, uh, the total expected profit. Uh, is um, uh, of the uh, of the uh, cooperative uh, 
outperforms the individual, the total expected profit of the individual uh, 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 players or supply chains. And we realize that it's not always the case that cooperative uh, leads to uh, a superior, uh, you know, um, uh, scenario or case. Uh, we need to be very careful about the way that we uh, we do our pricing, and we our pricing strategy basically influences the performance uh, and incentive. Uh, uh, of the players to join such cooperative. So the solution that um, uh, we um, suggested and recommended as part of this uh, analysis and observation was that um, uh, uh, there should be a kind of pricing contract uh, in place between the uh, cooperative uh, uh, associations or organizations and the supply chain players. Uh, before joining and, and starting, uh, you know, this uh, cooperative. Uh, and, and in that contract, the pricing uh, is a critical term because it will impact the way that demand kind of uh, generates in the market and, and it impacts the competition and also, um, and, and also the way uh, that, uh, you know, the whole uh, cooperative uh, after establishment will will operate and um, and and basically this is uh, one of the key findings that we had there. Um, um, we we use a twist stage game theory modeling approach and uh, examine the production inventory planning and pricing problem of multiple competing uh, uh, organic food supply chains in non cooperative and and cooperative scenario. And we realized that the cooperative mechanism can encourage uh, organic food supply chains to, um, to generate a greater profit margin and increase their utilization rate and uh, reduce their logistic and operations costs, um, uh, reduce their transpar transportation frequency because they, um, uh, they um, uh, obtain a better, uh, larger scale. And um, and all associated costs and um, and at the end of the day, through such cooperative mechanisms, if uh, developed appropriately, and if uh, you know um, uh, appropriate and suitable arrangement is made, uh, then um, organic food at the end of the day can become more affordable in terms of pricing, uh, and we can reduce the, uh, the final uh, price in the market. So that was the first piece, and um, I'm sure that you have some questions. I appreciate if you can just leave the questions at the end because you will see two different pieces. I will try to be a bit quicker um, uh, because of the time limit that we have. And, um, and uh, for that specific reason, I think uh, given the time, I just uh, give you a very quick overview of the second piece that we have here which is recently published in uh, Transportation Research Part E. And that was, uh, again, uh, motivated by um, one of the uh, grants uh, that we recently received uh, from uh, Australian government, where um, their uh, letter uh, business school was the lead um, in that grant. And we the project was on enhancing experiential learning and uh, higher education entrepreneurial ecosystem by digital platforms. And there are some other universities as, um, um, uh, cooperating and collaborating with us in this project. And we have some industry partners and uh, consultancy firms uh, helping us in this project as well. Uh, and um, and uh, yeah, those are the partners that we have in this project. And um, basically the idea here was that um, Currently, universities in Australia and many other parts of the world, they are doing a lot in enhancing the students' employability um, uh, and entrepreneurial kind of uh, develop their entrepreneurial skill set as well. Um, and uh, but at the same time, we see that there are many uh, things that are happening in parallel, not necessarily efficient and um, still, um, you know, uh, with the rapid uh, pace of, you know, technology development and the requirement of the market and 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 fierce competition as well, uh, uh, we need more kind of uh, uh, integrated approach to uh, 
uh, those experiential learning kind of initiatives in um, higher education sector. And we need to bring together uh, different sort of, you know, um, uh, um, uh, stakeholders uh, and, uh, and community players and government bodies and so on to make the journey more kind of successful and more uh, accessible, more scalable and more um, uh, productive, uh, so to speak. So um, the aim was how can we uh, uh, conceptualize a digital platform, uh, which is uh, self-sufficient uh, and operationally and financially sustainable and uh, can engage different uh, parties and different bodies um, and at the end of the day contributes to um, uh, different players with different aims in different ways. What do I mean by that? We have students, um, in particular um, uh, uh, students who are going to graduate soon and they need exp experiential learning, they need to enhance their employability skill set and also entrepreneurial kind of um, uh, skill set. And if and they want to kind of um, uh, do some try and error while they're students and they want to work on some real world kind of problems. Um, and uh, we have universities who can uh, provide them with some equipments and space and facilities and training and so on. And there are some SMEs or startups and, um, you know, um, uh, some uh, companies uh, who are uh, just established and they want to uh, do something great, but they um, don't have the uh, sufficient uh, funds and financial resources available, as well as labor and workforce is very expensive for them. Uh, and at the same time, we have some uh, people in our community uh, who are willing to uh, invest in such uh, ideas and in such companies and firms. And at the same time, they want to exchange some equities in exchange, and they want to take the risk and invest for, um, uh, you know, uh, different uh, purposes. Some of them are looking for some uh, incentives, um, and uh, as long as it, you know, um, it, it's aligned with uh, our regulations, we can consider them as our community uh, partners. Um, and we are looking at how how can uh, government uh, universities and those players that I just mentioned can interact via a digital financing uh, platform uh, and how it can how such platform can um, raise the money and, and finance that is required to um, uh, to uh, support the operations of uh, their uh, this the startups or uh, entrepreneurships uh, supply chains. So that was the key idea, basically linking the um, uh, uh, digital finance and um, and government uh, and universities uh, uh, programs, uh, support programs to some operational level of um, uh, startup supply chain uh, decision making was the key idea that we had. Um, and we try to conceptualize such model and uh, mathematically model it and try to understand uh, different aspects of it. So there were t uh, three um, key research questions that we had. One was digital innovation in supply chain finance. We understand that multi-sided digital platforms, crowdfunding platforms can act as an enabler for the successful implementation of the um, uh, government's uh, goals and at the same time, enhancing the participation of the domestic entrepreneurs and, um, and, and risk averse investors as well. We wanted to uh, conceptualize that and model their decision making, so to speak. And at the same time, governments have different uh, policy making approaches. Some governments traditionally, when it comes to such intervention policies, they look at their um, uh, look at it as a money kind of generation um, uh, initiative or um, uh, you know um, uh, 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 opportunity. Uh, whereas some other governments look at those as a kind of social welfare, enhancing social welfare kind of opportunity, uh, and and trying to uh, develop some indigenous innovation strategy through such support mechanisms. And and it's not something that we just are, um, you know, uh, ideating here or just, um, you know, it's not coming from our imagination. There are many governments and many policymakers um, uh, in different countries 
in a specific, I can mention China, uh, who's doing uh, such policy making, uh, pursuing such policy making approach for uh, several years now, uh, which is called exactly indigenous innovation strategy through such um, uh, platforms and such support mechanisms they try to localize their IP ownership as much as it's possible and try to be open to, um, to, uh, to global business, but at the same time, try to uh, increase the share of their domestic supply chain in global market. And it all starts from such support mechanisms and their policy making approach. Um, and platform design and power structure was another uh, area that we were really interested in because we know that platforms can design in different ways. There are very interesting uh, textbooks and uh, some uh, non-academic books written on platform um, uh, um, uh, power structure and the way that platforms are uh, designed and uh, operate and how it impacts the behavior of the players and how it impacts the way people uh, you know decide and uh, depending on their different attributes of their decision making and also their um, uh, uh, their, um, their risk attitude as well uh, so what we were interested very much was um, okay how does this power structure in platform design um, you know, impacts the way that such platform operates and how it impacts the decision making of the players who are uh, interacting in such platforms. Um, and uh, and 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 uh, that was those were the key things that we were interested to understand and model and incorporate in our model. Um, and um, and and using uh, again uh, the secondary data and interview and um, and looking at the academic papers and so on, we came up with a um, kind of realistic um, uh, and, and industry driven. Um, a conceptual model for a multi-sided fintech platform. In the blue box, as you can see, there are different uh, portfolio, portfolio of products that are offered. Uh, equity crowdfunding, um, I'm sure that some of you are familiar with it, meaning that you, I as an investor invest um, some amount of money and, um, and uh, depending on the performance of the, uh, and I get some equity um, uh, as a result of my investment. And but it, it's very uncertain how much you know uh, I can get as a return on investment uh, as part of that equity exchange, and it all depends on the performance of the uh, supply chain uh, of the entrepreneur uh, or a startup company that I invested in uh, in a very uncertain and stochastic uh, uh, kind of situation and scenario. And on the other hand, there are fixed income fund as well, so I have a choice as an investor to whether. Um, to invest uh, my money in equity crowdfunding product or fixed income fund. And I can make a portfolio and kind of um, and divide my money between these two uh, platforms. Um, and, um, and we considered uh, another product as part of this multi-sided platform, which is lending facility, meaning that um, the company, um, the entrepreneurs or startup company, they can uh, opt to not to necessarily use those um, uh, 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 public investment uh, and exchange equity. Instead, they can go for um, classic uh, kind of uh, lending facility with fixed rate and so on, something very similar to what banks offer. So this is a, a platform that facilitates the interaction between public investors who are like small investors, like uh, my grandma, grandpa, or people who have a small amount of money, but yet they want to do something good for their kind of uh, domestic and national kind of um, uh, uh, young entrepreneurs and so on, uh, because, um, and then they invest their money in such crowdfunding platforms. Um, I'm sure that you're familiar with such platforms. It all began, you know, in larger scale with Kickstarter and so on. There are now many, many similar platforms like that. Um, so, uh, but at the lower end of this game, as you can see, we looked at a um, uh, supply chain of a domestic, national, or local supply chain, which is run by um, an entrepreneur who is financially constrained and need to raise that money through such multi-sided platform. And at the same time, that company is have to compete with um, uh, an established company 
um, uh, or corporate in a shared market, uh, which is not necessarily capital constrained. Um, and, 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 and we were very much interested in this um, uh, game, which was a modeled as a core not game. Uh, I'm sure that you're familiar with many of you um, in a shared market. Um, and we were interested in this game at this level. And at the same time, we were very much interested to see what is the investment behavior, how is the investment behavior of those uh, risk averse public investors, multiple of them with different risk attitudes. Some of them are risk averse, some of them are risk neutral. There's a degree to that as well. And how they decide on their uh, you know, uh, investment kind of decisions. And at the same time, we looked at the government decision-making as well, uh, look at two different policies. One was very much oriented on income, economic performance, and the other one was more on social welfare. And um, we looked at different levers that government has and how uh, and, and, and considered government as the game leader. So we modeled such a um, uh, concept as a three level uh, Stackelberg game uh, where government plays as a leader and uh, those investors and supply chains play as sub leader and follower. And we switched their position uh, in another scenario to understand the impact of uh, that leadership, which can be considered and, con um, and, and considered as a power of those players in that uh, platform, whether such platform gives more power to investors um, um, or it gives more power to entrepreneurs and supply chains um, in broader term. So we looked at their decision-making and, and all the uh, uncertainties and risk factors that we, uh, we had in such game. And we tried to develop a multi-level uh, Stackelberg game. And we tried to uh, solve it through uh, generalized Nash equilibrium and um, other methods uh, helping us to, uh, uh, to uh, study their, uh, their strategies in equilibrium um, and, and try to compare um, the impact, uh, their different, the result and outcome of different strategies, policy making strategies, and so on. Um, and um, and there were, if you recall, there were some, you know, uh, key objectives that we had. Uh, one of which was the impact of power structure and how such digital platforms should be um, designed um, uh, to to uh, generate better outcome. And usually the way that we model things in uh, multi-stage, um, you know, uh, game theoretical modeling uh, is called mechanism design. I'm sure, again, many of you are familiar with this term. Um, mechanism design means that you have multiple players with different objective functions, different constraints, and there are different sort of kind of um, a power structure in that game or framework that we are looking at. So you, we are looking at a kind of... Um, a specific um, uh, uh, sequence of events or decision tree kind of uh, uh, framework based on which we can see what decisions are made when and how is the sequence of those decision making, enabling us to develop our models and um, subsequently, you know, uh, develop some solution strategy to tackle those problems. I'm not going to get into the details of those um, uh, solutions. I'm sure that these are um, like uh, peanuts to many of you uh, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, tackling the complexities and uh, solving the mathematical models and so on. But we tried to kind of come up with some, um, uh, first of all, solve those models and understand their decision-making behavior. Uh, and after that, we tried to run some um, uh, some uh, analysis um, and, and compare different sort of policies and strategies to understand, to better understand the incentives and um, kind of the attitude of different players, whether they are willing to join such platform and contribute to that ecosystem. And, um, and, and like, um, as we expected, it's not always the case. There are some specific um, uh, situations and conditions under which 
uh, different players, um, their their interests are aligned, and they are they all are happy to collaborate and contribute to such platform and join this multi-sided environment that we have. Uh, but this helps us to better understand how such mechanism can be designed and how we should set the parameters for, let's say, subsidies or um, uh, or tariff if government is uh, making decision on that, or in terms of um, uh, uh, financing, what should be the interest rate that encourages most players to join such platforms and how much should be the return kind of rate set by that digital platform. Those are some of the insights that we get out of this uh, work. I think that um, we only have 10 minutes. I had another uh, work to uh, present, which is a working paper currently uh, under uh, fourth uh, revision in uh, uh, by POM uh, journal, Production and um, Operations Management. But I don't think that I will uh, have the time to uh, finish that um, uh, that part today. What I can do, I can uh, share the uh, the working paper, which is uh, available online, um, uh, with you guys. Take a look, and if you're interested, we can have another chat sometime um, about uh, around this uh, this work. This one, just in short. Um, this is um, one of the, you know, ongoing research that I'm involved in, which is looking at the interface of um, uh, global agricultural supply chains and international trade, and we are looking at the impact of um, uh, tariff rate quotas or, or in general, uh, international trade policy making of Australian government and its partners. When, because we, we understand that um, uh, in many countries, including Australia, they are now uh, looking at or revisiting their existing international trade policies, negotiating uh, their uh, bilateral or other uh, uh, types of uh, you know, agreements that they have. Uh, and what we are doing here, we are trying to look at such policy making in conjunction with uh, global supply chain and logistical uh, kind of uh, problems and issues that exist. And we understand that we cannot separately look at those problems. These are interconnected and uh, interrelated problems that did need to be looked at at the same time. And again, here we are looking at, we are using mechanism design and, um, and, and game theory here, non-cooperative game theory to understand the interaction uh, between policymakers, international trade policymakers, and individual uh, 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 global uh, agricultural supply chains in terms of their decision-making, when to produce, how much to produce, how much to export from Australia, let's say to UK, and um, when to do that, whether use this type of you know a tariff um, uh, a scheme or uh, uh, administration a scheme or that type of administration a scheme leads to better outcome and so on and all those again are um, are uh, modeled and analyzed through um, uh, through uh, non cooperative game theoretical modeling uh, but here we have more we have the luxury of accessing more uh, real world data from the case study that we have, and we used um, uh, all those data that we collected to validate the modeling that we are developing here. Uh, and we are we we have um, we have the opportunity to test the uh, uh, the prescriptive uh, uh, modeling approach uh, or models that we develop uh, to kind of see whether. Uh, they're leading to, uh, you know, uh, reasonable uh, outcome or not, comparing the uh, uh, the the um, result of uh, our uh, mathematical modeling against the existing um, um, data that we have from the same industry, uh, help us to kind of um, uh, uh, check and uh, and and verify the validity and consistency of our modeling. Um, there are four uh, dot points that I share with you, uh, just uh, as a result of my engagement in those projects. 
Uh, engaging in research projects dealing with policy making is really fun. I'm sure that you all have such experience uh, in comparison with pure theoretical uh, uh, modeling or theoretical work. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, we should be prepared and excited and at the same time be ready to get toasted because uh, sometimes people who work in policymaking, government bodies and so on, or industry, they have very different perspective and approach to research um, and, and, and problem solving. Um, uh, and in my experience, sometimes you can tell if you are taken seriously when you share your results and outcome with some industry people and policymakers, and they return with four pages of <laughs> critique, and some of them can be really harsh and, uh, you know, criticizing the, your approach and the way that you model and analyze your work. Uh, but we shouldn't feel really bad if we frequently told, yeah, you're, yeah, that's interesting, but you're just scratching the surface. There's much, much more to that. And, and uh, sometimes it's a bit kind of, you know, uh, uh, I felt a bit bad. Oh, my God. Okay, there's much uh, more that I should learn. And uh, seems that I have to go back to my theoretical work. And, but it's not like that. Um, uh, continue. We are all working progress, quote and unquote, and, um, and we are doing our best. So uh, and lastly, uh, different parties that you work with from industry, government bodies, this country, that country, they may have their own agenda and their different objectives and desires. And we shouldn't, as researchers, try to um, you know, uh, to kind of echo uh, individuals' voice through our uh, work, but we need to be kind of uh, a bit, um, uh, try to be independent, unbiased, and uh, try to exactly highlight those uh, contradicting objectives and contradicting kind of desires and, the, and views and opinions of different players involved in that problem. I think, and we believe, you know, that this is exactly policymakers need to be become aware of. Uh, what are the different, um, you know, uh, perspectives and what are the challenges of different players in that ecosystem? And, 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 and to be honest, we realize that this is exactly what top journals um, uh, like to see as well. Uh, when, um, you know, we, uh, you submit your work and um, the uh, kind of feedback you receive, I think, um, uh, they will like, like it that way um, as well. So thank you so much for listening to me. I'm, I hope that uh, I could, uh, uh, you know, uh, share uh, something meaningful and useful today. And I look forward to receiving your questions and comment and feedback. Thank you.